be starting a, a series, don't know how short or long it's going to be, but it's going to be all about wisdom. Look to your neighbor, say, get wisdom. Get wisdom. This is what the series is called, get wisdom. Get it, get it, go after it, get it. In Proverbs 4, 7, it says, getting wisdom is the wisest thing that you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing. Thing that you can do. Whatever else you do, get good judgment. So we're going to be taking a look at the Proverbs mostly and going throughout the Bible, as we always do. We, as, this, is, this is the foundation of everything we believe, teach, preach, and, and go after. And the Holy Spirit uses that and, and just ignites our hearts to it. But Proverbs is going to be where we pull most of our scriptures from. It is a book of wisdom. It's, it's considered the book in the Old Testament of wisdom, written by a man named Solomon, who is believed to be, second only to Jesus, the most wise man to ever walk on the face of this planet. And these are his teachings, his sayings, his proverbs, inspired divinely by the Holy Spirit, given to us. Uh, I know sometimes this may, when we read it, remind us of things like fortune cookies and, and, and things of that nature, but how imperative it is that we, we take these Proverbs. You know why I really love Proverbs? Because it reminds me of someone that is just so abstract or, or ADD and kind of all over the place. It doesn't just fit like there's not just one chapter that says, okay, this is a chapter about your finances. And another one that says, this is a chapter uh, about salvation. Another, this is a chapter. I mean, you can have one proverb and it just cover from A to Z. It reminds me a lot of myself. I mean, it just... It, it just one part is about love, one part is about temptation, one part is about, uh, about finances, one part is about prosperity, one part is about, uh, um, you just go on, the list goes on and on, and that's one chapter. And there's 30 of these chapters, and I love it, I love it. They're little trinkets, I write them down on index cards, most of them are like a tiny sentence, and you take those, and you put them in your heart, and you write them on your mirror, and you write them somewhere to keep in your vehicle, and you write them and look at them wherever you may, may go that they're there for you. Most of you know, if you've been here, that I take index cards and I keep them in my back pocket. So when I'm on the, at the workplace or, or wherever I may be, and I face, whether it's temptation, uh, it, it, could be, it could be lust, it could be uh, drug or alcohol related, it could be to get angry or, or, or act on that anger, I pull that out and I just read it. Word of God, the Holy Spirit just grabbing hold of my heart and just puts it back in focus. Wisdom. So this is what we're looking at and going through for the next several weeks. Are you with me? Wisdom. You look into the Proverbs, and there's four different types of men or people that we see in the Proverbs. And the first one is the fool. Don't be a fool. The first one is a fool. The fool is, is someone who just doesn't care. The second one is the simple. The simple is someone who may just not know. Stay in that ignorance. The third one is the mocker. The mocker is a hater. Uh, uh, for here and this side of the world, mockery may come through forms of, of, of persecution like gossip or, or somebody just making fun of you for your walk or, or you know, it, in my line, it's like a nasty email to somebody who doesn't agree with somebody. And that's the worst that I get, really. But you go over to the other side of the world in the 1040 window where it's illegal to be a Christian in places like Asia, Africa, and, and over there, and, and they face persecution. The mocker uh, destroys. The mocker um, tortures. The mocker puts you in prison. The mocker can kill you for your faith. So that's another type of person here in, in the Proverbs. And then the fourth is the one that we're talking all about, and that's the wise. The wise. It's encouraging to know that you all, we all can go after wisdom. We can all go after wisdom. We can all be wise. We just have to go for it. And it all begins with, with this one statement, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. This is the foundation. This is the cornerstone. Everything else built upon the wisdom that you were called to have as a follower of Jesus is built upon this. The, 
fear of the Lord. Knowledge of the Holy One, it results in good judgment. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23, it says that the fear of the Lord, it leads to, let's say it together, it leads to life. The fear of the Lord leads to life, bringing security and protection from harm. Sometimes we, we hear this word fear, and, and we can have a wrong perception uh, of what it's talking about. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Does it, is it talk, I do believe that it's talking about God is so almighty and so big and powerful. He's the, the creator of heaven and earth. Scripture says he uses the earth. He could use it as his footstool. So if he wanted to take me as a human being creature and squish, squish me like an ant under his thumb, yes, he can. There is nothing stopping him. So when you hear, oh, that's not the God because that's, that's not the fear I'm talking about, yes. You can fear him in that kind of way if you want to because he is capable of that. But also the understanding and more so my heart leaning in towards the fear of the Lord that, wow, he is the creator of heaven and earth. He's the maker of all things good. He is the one that is all throughout the Bible from beginning to end performing these miracles and signs and wonders, deliverance healings, restorations, you name it, he's, he's done it if it's good. There is nothing new under the sun. He, he's, he, he's, his character, I'm just in awe of his character and the amazement and in the awesomeness that through what he's done by sending Jesus Christ to be the propitiation for my sin, that now I can have this relationship with him that he's not some far off being God. He's not on the other side of the cosmos, but he's father. And I'm son. And I'm in awe of, of that, that he loves me so much. Psalm 139 says he knows the number of hairs upon my head. And I look out and, and, and uh, for some of us, he can count quick, you know. But for some of us, it takes a while. And he knows them all. He knows the inside. He knows everything about you and me, yet he loves me. He loves me at my worst and he loves me at my best. He gave me grace and mercy to save me from myself. He gave me a substitute known as Jesus Christ to pay a price that I could never pay, to be, be the, the, the check that I could never write, that he went upon the cross for the sin of mankind, and he wore the weight of the world and all the sin of the world and all the doubt of the world upon his own shoulders so that I could be free and walk in this life of freedom as a son. And not only that, let's keep that, that because of what Jesus did and rose from the grave after three days, he says that me taking on this relationship, not religion, but relationship with Jesus Christ, that I'm now co-heir with Christ Jesus. That that which is rewarded and given to Christ Jesus as an inheritance is my inheritance as well. And now I'm that, that means that I'm God's son, but I'm also Jesus' brother. I mean, let's, I can't wrap my mind around that. The fear of the Lord is, is, is to give in to the knowledge that all right, this is knowledge. Though I may not fully understand it, I go after it. And this knowledge, it gives me good judgment. And the fear of the Lord in this kind of way gives me perspective. And that's why it goes on to say in, in verse 23 of Proverbs 19, it leads to life, bringing security and protection from harm. I believe that has a lot to do with right thinking. That because of all this, I know my identity. I'm not dealing with an identity crisis. Because I, under, I, I see this is who God is. And in light of who he is, who I am as his son. And I'm in awe of that. I, I, and so I'm, I'm fearful of that. But I'm in love with him and him. He's father. He's son. He's given us Holy Spirit living in us. Dwelling within the body of Christ. To save us from ourselves over and over and over again. So that we do now have a choice. That in my flesh I'm weak. But in a mind that is set on Christ. And on things above there is life. There is wholeness. There is peace. There's direction. And so I have choices. And I'm strengthened. Holy Spirit. Does this make sense? I mean, are you, are you with me? This is, 
This is all entailed in the fear of the Lord. Going after wisdom means I'm, I'm going after the character of God. I'm learning who God is. Before I know my calling or my purpose, I have to know who I am. And I learn who I am by learning who He is. And then who He is teaches me who I am. And I don't do it just by listening to different people. I do it by searching His Word. The Proverbs say that it's, it's the privilege of God to conceal a matter. And it, or it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. And it's the privilege of a king to search that matter out. It's, it's the glory of God to conceal His mysteries. And it's the privilege of king. If I'm co-heir with Christ Jesus, that means I'm royalty. He says in His Word that you are called as kings and priests. So it's our privilege that we get to search the mysteries out. And these are the mysteries found in here. So don't just listen to someone else. Test this. Find out who God is for yourself. I love teaching and I love preaching, but how much more important it is that you wake up daily, diligently yielding to Father God, pick up that devotional, pick up the Word of God, and just go through the Proverbs. There are 30 Proverbs, one for every day. And if there's 31 days in, a year, in, a, in the month, guess what? Take the last one off. Go after it. Go after wisdom. And so the word today that we're really focusing on, going through wisdom, going through the Proverbs, is contentment. It's contentment. And a lot of times, like right away, immediately you think happy, or, or you think satisfied. You may even think uh, like complacent, which it's not. But what I love about this word and what I love about these scriptures is that you find contentment when you go after wisdom. You find it. Contentment's in the Bible from start to finish. Uh, but I, I really like this verse because of, of in 1923, because it says the fear of the Lord, it leads to life. Another word for that is contentment. And the promise of, of life here, it's not just talking about giving you air to breathe, but he's talking in a, about an abundance life, an abundant life. He gives life in abundance. The fear of the Lord, it produces contentment and life within us. And then from that fullness of life, there is this Encompassing peace, and joy, and grace, and touches from God upon our life that are, are so influential and, and are so and just so amazing, and even leave us. Scripture tells us untouched by trouble. Untouched by trouble. So my, I may be in the midst of the storm. He is the perfect calm in the storm. For those whose mind is set on. There's always that stipulation. I'm not feeling it right now. Surrender. Give it. He is, he is God that He will not be found as a liar. But we play a very important part in the way we respond to God's Word. Amen? Contentment is a promise that it's, it's offered to every single follower of Jesus if we would receive it. Have you ever been around somebody that they're, they're just so content with life and immediately like it changes the way you want to live? I mean, do you know somebody like that? I can immediately think of several people that are like that. And I'm going to, you know, right off the bat, I want to talk about, you know, my mom and my dad. Two people that have given me this example of, of contentment right, right off the bat. Um, and the way that they, they're best friends. And, and I love that and I want that. I see that in their example that they've always set for me. Whether that's the case or not in the contentment, that's what I've seen growing up. So that's what I know. Be careful what your children see because that's what they'll know. Right? We're setting an example for them. So whether, whether sometimes you have to act a certain way in front of your children to protect them, you do what you have to do. But you're the parent to protect, to lead, to guide, to raise up your child. Be careful how you do that. But I've always seen contentment. I've seen, I've seen them as, as best friends, and I've, I want that. I want to go after that in, in my own marriage. And then 
my, my dad and my mom and their work ethic, they've always done whatever they've had to do. If they've got to work more hours, if they've got to get the second job, they've done what they've had to do. And so in light of that, I believe I have a pretty good work ethic, and I think it came from that example. My, my dad, he's just, he's somebody, he, you know, as long as I can remember, he's, he's, they've wanted to bless people, whether that be in construction, uh, giving, giving food to somebody, trying to help somebody, doesn't care who knows, but he's always raised us up like that. Somebody needs something. There's a time to pray, and then there's a time to ask. You know, you see that guy that doesn't have any food, don't pray for him a hamburger, go get him something to eat. You know, and he's always given me that example of, of helping and blessing people and, and, and just who they are. And so these are, are things that I, that I want, that I want to emulate. Am I there? No. But do I want it? Yes. He's, they've never missed, or very rarely have they missed, any of my ball games that I, as, long, as far as I can remember, going through high school until graduation. And, and I remember these things, and I want to emulate those things. And in all those, it's like they, they never, like, like Dad never had a bad day. I know he did, but it's like he never did. And, and if it was me, I'd be like a puddle in the fetal position. You know what I'm saying? But, but that's just that's what I, I would see. And, and things happen. Obviously, things happen because we all live in the same world that's fallen and messed up. But that's what I see. And I believe it all comes from this place of content. That just being where you are. Seizing that moment. Being where you are. All these are attributes of contentment. And we should, we should aspire and, and emulate that, not through necessarily a person, but through what his word teaches. And I'm, I'm definitely not there yet. And, you know, we live in a day and a time where we've never had more and enjoyed less. I mean, is that, do I stand alone in that? Like, we're, 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 we have so much right now, but, but it's, it, it, it's like in all that we have, uh, and, and all the tech and all the stuff and all the gizmos and the gadgets and all the toys. It's like we have more, but we, we enjoy less. And just in a, you know, a silly illustration, my wife and I, only eight years married, right? So we're still, you know, we're, we're young, we're green. And we, we got a five-month-old and we got a six-year-old. But, but already we're like, we're talking about, you know, the lack of contentment or not contentment is dissatisfaction, always wanting that which you do not have. And, and you know, we're, we're laying in bed some mornings on a day where we can kind of sleep in a little bit. And we're like, man, I, well, I wish we could sleep in, you know, <laughs> to be an empty master. You know, to, and that's kind of the thought and the little conversation that goes on. It's like, man, to kind of be able to sleep in, I have to get the kids ready for work and or ready for school and. Seems like empty nesters just they're vacationing all the time, and I just want to. And then we go and we talk to the empty nester. The empty nester's like, yeah, I wish I could see those kids again. And the pitter patter of the feet coming into the time that I could have back with them. It's like, well, well, I'll give you my kids for a little bit, and I'll go on your vacation. And it's like, you always want uh, like what you don't have. And I know that's just a kind of a silly illustration, but the thought, it very much so applies to always looking beyond where you are or what you have or who you're with. Technology. There has never been a day and an age where there is more tech here than there is right now in this, this time. More platforms of social media, the phone, the smartphone. How many, how many iPhone people do I have out there? By a show of hands. God bless you. How many, Andro How many Android people do I have out there? You know, we started an outreach ministry here for Android users, and I'm glad it's working. God bless you. God bless you. No, we love you. We love you. But don't, don't be upset. Like, if, if my little bubble, if it turns green, that means somebody in the group is Android. I'm out. I'm out. No, I, I'm just kidding. I love you. But... Love every Jesus came for the iPhone and the Android. Love you. Um, but in that, we have so much tech. One phone uh, is, is said to do the work of, of 50 different pieces of technology, like a, a level that has replaced a GPS, calculator, camcorder, camera level, and so on. You think of all the different apps 
that we may have. If you know Brother Joaquin that leads our children's ministry, he's got 20 pages full of, I mean, he, whew, check him out after church when you pick your children up. And then sign up to help. We have, we have things, technology now that I want to talk about. Amazon, I mean, next day delivery. It's, it's, I have a pastor friend who lives in Richmond. He has a drone that comes and drops packages off at his front door. We're coming now to a place of same day delivery. You know, there are cars that now drive themselves. We, we have smart TVs and, and controllers that control the light shades, the TV, the lights. I mean, everything. And, Maybe the greatest invention ever, Netflix. And, and how at, at the, the click of a button, the click of a button, the, the, the click of a mouse, Netflix just happens like that. And just to give you kind of a perspective, because as we go through the, the time, uh, the timeline from where it was to where it is, we can easily forget. You know, I remember... My favorite movie, if you don't already know, you will find out if you come to church here enough, is Mel Gibson's Braveheart. And Mel Gibson's Braveheart came out in 1995. Now, when that movie came out, in order to go see that movie, in, like when it came out to VHS, in order for me to go see that movie, I would have to think about, okay, I'll go see it on a Friday night, so I'm going to go pick it up from Blockbuster. Because that was the place. And so you would go to Blockbuster. This is all you had to do to see Mel Gibson's Braveheart. You would go to Blockbuster. You would, there would be that, that, that punk teenager that doesn't know anything about the story, but where is it? And he'd point in the, the general direction of every movie. And so finally you'd find it and you'd see the case, which meant absolutely nothing because you had to have a clear box. But it's a Friday night and there's no clear box. So then you get back into your car. And if you are an Amelia person, you go to your second choice to Blockbuster at that time, which was Master Video. Which I believe at that time was behind what is now Mario. And so you would go there and it wasn't so much use. So you would find Mel Gibson and you'd take it to your house. You'd pop it into your VHS. You'd watch the movie. And it's not over yet. Great movie, but you have to be kind and rewind. We do remember. Because if you don't, the FBI is going to come after you. And so you'd, you'd be kind and you rewind and then you take it back the next day because if you don't, they're going to tag on that charge. And Lord forgive me, but I probably owe hundreds of dollars to Blockbuster, but they closed down so they can't collect. But that's, that is now, oh, brave one, click. That's where it's gone. From... Maybe I, I drew that out in painting the full picture, but it's gone from that to where we're at right now with, with technology and the speeds of what we have. And, and I love that if you take that into a perspective of the gospel message, how awesome it is that we can use social media platforms to share the gospel. You think of what Jesus Christ and, and the apostles and Paul and these men had to do and where they had to go and walk to get there to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we have these platforms to where we can click and type and then send a message, the gospel message, clear across the world like that. So the same thing that may be used for evil can be used for good, depending on how we use it. But for the majority, even for those who are sitting here, and I probably speak to just about every person, you may not have social media, but you have a phone probably. How we have all this stuff, but, but is it really for the better? Is it, is it really for the better? Every statistic out there says that we are less satisfied now than ever. So the question of the day is why? Why are we not happy with where we are? Why are we not happy with what we have? Why are we not happy with, with who we are with? What's creating all of this discontent? And the truth behind it is there is an enemy to being content. And that enemy is probably not going anywhere. It's called comparison. Comparison. Number one, if you're taking notes, I'd love for you to write this down. Going through the Proverbs is very much so going to be more teaching 
than usual preaching you may be used to. But this is where we build fruit. Amen, church? This is where, okay, the Lord is going to prune and, and produce. He's going to prune and He's going to produce. And He's going to produce good fruit in the body of Christ. I love that He's a God of second chances. He, he loves us so much, however we may be and have come in, but He loves us too much. Isn't He a good God? Praise the Lord for that. So if you're writing these down first, the, the, the enemy, one of the enemies of contentment is comparison. And we live in a culture of comparison. It's just the reality. In Proverbs 14, verse 30, it says, A peaceful heart, that word peaceful is also translated, a content heart leads to a healthy body. But jealousy, that word is also translated comparison in the original, is like cancer to the bones. A content or peaceful heart is a health, leads to a healthy body. You ever heard the Word of God is like medicine to the body? And I, I've told you I was clinically depressed on medicine, but as I started reading the Word uh, faithfully day in as a devotional, it doesn't have to be a long time. I haven't taken medicine in I don't know how long. The Word is medicine to the body. Then a peaceful, content heart leads to a healthy body. Jealousy or comparison is like cancer to the bone. Comparison, it, it brings wrong perspective. It brings wrong perspective. So one of the things that comparison does is it brings wrong perspective. It cultivates this belief that what we have is not good enough. And it's been there from the beginning. This, this rule of comparison. But these platforms, social media and technology, is like throwing this amazing fuel on a fire and, and just watching it just take off and erupt and destroy. Now, I believe that Facebook was, was created in good motive to bring connection and networking. And, and be, you know, I can, I can see somebody's Facebook happy birthday that I haven't seen in a long time, and so I can say happy birthday, but then you start trolling through the pages. And next thing you know, you're seeing how one of your friends is, is uh, you know, they, just, they just got something that's new. They, they just got a new house, new car, new, new TV, new, new boat, new job, you know, hashtag bless. You know, and you're like, I, I just I'll burn your house down, man. You know, but, you know the, that thing of, of comparison. Or, you know, you're on vacation in Virginia Beach. Love in your vacation. Pick up the phone and you see a friend who's in the Bahamas or Cancun, and you're like, you know, it, and that's that is can be a reality. As silly as that may be, again, take that thought and apply it to to just how we are comparing ourselves, who we're with, what we're doing, what we're missing out on, because we can see everybody else's feed. Who cares? I mean, that, that's not in my notes, but it's like, you know, we just we have to be satisfied and content with where we are and who we're with and what we're doing. If not, we're going to miss the blessings that God has given us. We're going to miss the people that He has blessed us with. You know, there's a statistic out there that shows um, whoever spends, that when people spend more than, than 10 minutes on social media, they become less dissatisfied with the place that they are in. And it also causes stress and anxiety upon that person. So another uh, enemy of comparison is that, or, or description in comparison is that it makes us believe wrong presumptions of things. You know, every billboard, every commercial that we see is, if you just get one more, there's always, I've got the iPhone whatever, there's now an iPhone 20 million, and if you just get the next one out there, you know, you can, you can do even more. You know, it, it, it's, it, if you just take this pill, you can be a little bit skinnier. If, if you just add that one thing to your life, your life will be a little bit better, you'll be a little bit more happy. And that goes right into I mean, sin and wickedness. You know, the, the porn industry. You know, you want happiness, it's just one click away. You, you want to numb those, those feelings, it's just one more drink away. 
you, you want to just go ahead. Go, go back. Go back. And do the things you were doing before you found yourself here longing after something more than those things you've been trying to fill that God-shaped void hole in your heart with. And it just keeps on proving that these things aren't doing it. There is but one thing, one name, one person, one book, one relationship. That's it. There's nothing else that you need to bring contentment. Because everything will fall short. There is but one. All these things are things, but they give you the wrong... And the world just paints this picture of wrong presumption. One thing. Jesus, that's it. And I'm not saying that to be legalistic. I'm not saying that to be religious. I'm saying it to show you there is a reality. You are here for a reason. Don't forget two years from now or a month from now why you first came here in the first place when everything starts getting better or, or, or Billy Bob, you know, he said something mean, so now you want to leave. People are going to let you down. They will. They will. It's just how it is. You're not here for other people. You're here for you. And don't forget that, that this is, is not based on making you happy. It's based on giving you a life of fulfillment. In this life, you're going to have trouble. But when you have a content heart from that, will stir up joy in the midst of tribulation. Get your eyes off of everybody else, everything else, every other whatever scenario out there. Jesus, man. And plug into a group that believes the same way. You know, I have a little life group or small group, whatever, that meets once a week. And, and, and we hold each other accountable. I need that in my life. I had somebody whisper to me Friday night who, who were, was going through something. And then a, a worship song came on and they whispered in, in my ear. And, and the, the song was talking about joy. And they worshiped, or they, they whispered in my ear, remind me of this song next time I come to a place with a bad attitude. There's perspective that we get when we read God's Word. And the Holy Spirit moves when we put ourselves in a position to allow Him to move. He speaks when we position ourselves to hear His voice. I need to speed up a little bit. Often times, So, all right, I'll go to this theologian. You've probably heard of him. I'm not saying he's a great dude. Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey wrote uh, a long time ago, or, or he said in an interview, he said, everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they dreamed of doing so they can see that it's not the answer. And as I was preparing my notes, I, I came across this, and I thought that's pretty good. And a lot of you are, are probably thinking, well, let me first become rich and famous and do everything that I've dreamed of doing, and then I, I'll let you know how it works for me. But there's also been a study done with people who have only, uh, who are in a bracket of a purse of $25 million or more, a pocket that, that is, is fluffy of $25 million or more. And it, it was to gauge their happiness and contentment. And every single time there was some sort of discontentment in their life, that it, their, their, whether it be family or, or work or anxieties or depressions that would come from whatever, and, eat, and the, the overall, the majority, what will make you happier? And they would say, if I had just a fraction, just one-fourth more money, then I would be okay. Then I would be better. I would be happy. Always a little bit more. O always a little bit more. Contentment right here, right now, where you are at. Being fine where you are. Amen? In 2013, there was this study that was done and, and a disorder came about from it called FOMO, fear of missing out. It is a disorder that is defined as a pervasive anxiety that stems from missing out. Missing out from what our peers are doing. Missing out from being in the know about something. Missing out from being a part of something that's better than, than who we're with or, or what we're doing right now. And my fear isn't that I'm going to miss out on this other stuff. Listen carefully. My fear is that I'm going to miss out on what I already have, what has been given to me. Fear that I'm going to miss out on my children. Fear that I'm going to miss out on my wife. 
fear that I'm going to miss. Nothing is wrong with aspirations and goals. Nothing. I have things that I want and aspirations and goals and, and all that. Nothing is wrong with that. It's when it becomes an idol or when it takes the place, and if I could just get a little bit more, a few more dollars, a little bit more nice stuff, in, in, the, in the sense that it gets in the way, causes discontent. It gets in the way of being content where you are with your, your thing. Where you are in your, your guy. I'm so busy, I don't have time to just once a week take it to church. Not disregard the together, the unity, the body of Christ. Next to the, the, the birthplace of the first church, he said that, that there were certain things that happened, and in that was the fellowship of the, belief, of the believers and the breaking of the bread of the body of Christ. The fellowship is not just hanging out. Hey, man, let's talk about hunting. Good. I love talking about hunting. That's how I fellowship. But it's also talking about a, a give and take and spiritual and feeding and encouragement. Lifting and exhortation, accountability. Be content with this. What we have right here. Look around. Can we? Can we? The Lord gave me a word. He says, "I was I was thinking about all these things and aspirations that I have for the church and goals and visions for for what God is going to do. I love covenant, and I believe it in a big way. I believe it. you have no idea what goes on. It's crazy. You'd be scared." But one morning, the Lord it just brought me to my knees. He is faithful to God. He gives me the opportunity. Because here, the Lord is developing, creating, cultivating, discipling the world change. Here. The people are you. The people are giving their lives. Be very Be content in the Lord. And in closing, probably the most content person in the Bible, leading the pack, probably because we have the most unique life about him, is this man named Paul. He was an apostle. He wrote two thirds of the New Testament. So content, but he wasn't born. It says in. in uh, Philippians chapter 4, starting with verse 6. Don't worry about anything. He said, pray about everything. This is how we fight our battles. Tell God what you need. Thank Him for all that He has done. Then you will experience that. That's the only scripture. I don't, I don't need to do this. Let the Word of God do what only it can do. Tell God what you need. Thank Him. There, there, there's the kicker. Before you ever receive it, thank Him. Before you ever receive it, taste and see that God. I've encountered the Lord. I know Him. I know His power. I know what He's capable of. Though I may not see it and tangibly be able to touch it, faith is the evidence of things hoped for and the substance of things that I have not yet physically received, but I believe it. So I thank Him. And I'm content in that. Thank Him for it. And for all that He has done. Then you'll experience God's peace. Which exceeds anything that we can understand. Realize what you have. One of the bold things. Realize what you have. You take a note, write it down. Realize what you have. Realize what you have. Realize what you have. We have this, this thing in the, in the men's ministry that we call the, ble the blessing roll call. And there is so much uh, uh, that's going on. And, and you know, if, if you are facing trouble or hardship or, or hurt or pain, I'm not saying that's... You give it to God. You, you cry out to God. God loves that. I'm not knocking on that at all. But thank Him also. You know, for me, I, I find myself sometimes getting into this, like, pity party because of all the things that are wrong. But thank Him, I, I've come into this habit now where I've memorized blessings. 
I've memorized blessings. Thanking Him for all that He has done. Lord, I thank You. I thank You. I thank You that You've given me breath. I thank You that I was able to get up out of bed today. I thank You, Lord, for my daughter. I thank You for my son. I thank You for my wife. I thank You for this church and the people that are within it. I thank You for the community and the unity and the love for what is happening. I thank You, God, for all that You are doing. I thank You, God, that Jesus Christ gave me a second chance. I thank you, God, that you forgive me daily. I thank you, God, that my mercies are made new every single morning. I thank you that you empower me by your Holy Spirit. I thank you, God, that I am the head and not the tail. I'm above and not below. I thank you, God, that you say in your word that you have plans to prosper me, that I am prosperous, that you have plans to give me a hope and a future. I thank you, God, that no weapon formed against me shall ever prosper. I thank you, God, that I am hidden with you in Christ Jesus. I thank you that you have called me by name. I thank you that you have created in me a steadfast spirit. I thank you that you have given me peace that surpasses all human understanding. I thank you, God. I thank you, God, that I can be free but your slave. That I can be dead to sin and alive in Christ. Dead but alive. I thank you, God. Thank you that the creator of the heaven and earth thinks about me so much that if you never did anything else for me, you gave me a way into eternal life, into heaven. You saved me from hell. I thank you. If there is nothing else good that could ever come from this world, I thank you, God, for what you have done. Thank you. And then you will experience God's peace. The work. which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true. Let's keep going. And honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Let's say this together. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Then the God of peace will be with you. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says that this is a trustworthy saying. Paul didn't ever forget where he came from. He was beaten. He was bruised. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He was tortured. He was shipwrecked. His friends betrayed him. I mean, he went through the ringer. He died a martyr's death. He was, he, 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 was, he was killed for what he believed about Jesus. And you think we have bad days. Because he chose to follow Christ in spite of all things. This is a trustworthy saying, Paul said, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I'm the worst of them all. He recognized I was the worst of them all. Y'all don't know me the way that I know me. I know what I deserve. And I thank Him that He didn't give me what I deserve. God had mercy on me. So that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of His great patience with even the worst sinners. Then, here's, here's, here's what's so awesome. Then he could use, having been such a horrible sinner, saved by grace and forgiveness, the power of a testimony, then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life because of the testimony of what God did in Paul and in Dusty and in you. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. And amen. He alone is God. Amen. And amen. Make God our source. At the end of the day, it's not about stuff or material. The void of life can only be filled through one. Philippians 2.12, and this is it. Therefore, my beloved, as you have also obeyed, not as in my presence only. Because you may not always have a preacher. But now much more in my absence. 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The beginning of wisdom, the foundation of wisdom, wisdom, fear of the Work out your salvation with, let's say it together, fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Everything that we need is working for us. It's found in Christ. If you are here this morning, and this is you, among of all, I was the worst. You don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you're hearing what I'm saying, and you're here this morning, and you're in a place where you're tired of running, and you're just flat tired. And you don't know where you're going to go after this world. And, I mean, it will. This is a temporary place. How should you think you own? You're just running. You don't know where you're going. The Lord offers a way and He offers the freedom and fullness of life right here. If that's you today and you want to receive Him as your Lord and Savior, forgiver of your life, if we could, just, if we could bow our, our, our heads and close our eyes. And, and as you lift, as, as you think about this, you know, the Word of God says, Scripture says that if you acknowledge poor man, He will acknowledge you. If, if you are ashamed of him, you'll be ashamed. If you want to acknowledge that, that you need a Savior,